It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. This is how we do when we party. It's the 202. It's the 202. Hello, everyone. Here's what's coming up on the 202. A new thought-provoking exhibit in D.C. takes us back to a pivotal time in the 1960s. It involves the people, the police, and an urban intervention. Plus, by day, she's a local immigration attorney. By night, she's an Afro-jazz singer. Lordy Jorge joins us. It's all up next on the 202. Welcome to the 202. I'm Furman Patterson here with my lovely co-host, Michelle Wright. Thank you so much, Furman. And over on the turntables is the 202's guest DJ today, DJ Casper. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the months after the assassination of Martin Luther King and the riots that devastated D.C., a program called the Pilot District Project was created to improve the shattered relationship between the city's citizens and its police force. On the 50th anniversary of the 68 riots, a new exhibit takes a look back at a troubled nation and an ambitious urban project meant to bring the police, the people, and the city together. The exhibition's curators, Ann McDonough and Sarah Levitt, join us today. Thank you both for stopping by the 202. Thanks so much for having us. We're Thank thrilled you. to be here. And in Sarah, yes, it was great to get to meet you guys to talk about you or to hear you talk about your past. You said you were a librarian. Your mom was a librarian. Mm -hmm. And was it her mom's Absolutely. mom too? <laughs> yes, my grandmother was a high school librarian and my mom was a, a, a public librarian at the New York Public Library. And I'm uh, the library and collections director at the Historical Society of Washington, DC. So continuing the family tradition, but just in uh, my, my new hometown, Washington, DC. Wow. Well, you're both so. uh, curators, but you're from two different places. Uh, tell us about that. Absolutely. I'm a curator at the National Building Museum in DC. We're a museum of architecture, design, the built environment. All right. And so how did, how did this come together, this yeah. exhibit, and you two working together? Absolutely. Well, the Historical Society has been around since 1894, collecting and preserving, providing access to the stories of the local uh, community here in Washington, D.C. And this exhibit comes out of, I hate to admit it, actually, it was a collection that we had had since 2005, and it was in our unprocessed uh, section. Wow. Okay. And all it said on the outside of the box was police study. That's it. And we got it in 2005, but it sat on the shelf until 2016. So this is um, post-Ferguson, post-Baltimore, and seeing a little label that says police study all of a sudden becomes a little bit more intriguing. You know, So we pulled it off the unprocessed shelf, we looked into it, and all of a sudden we're looking at a story that, um, of a federal experiment that was, um, it was a pilot project that was um, uh, taking federal funds to look at, as you mentioned, um, the relationship between the police and the communities that they were supposed to serve. Um, and so this, these were the records of a project that, um, if you look at the newspaper coverage at the time, it, the newspapers were calling it, what, a flop? A flop. A yeah. flop, right? Um, a very expensive flop. I think <laughs> over, it was $1.4 million were put into this project. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and what was interesting, I found at the time when we took it off the shelf, was I asked a bunch of people, did you know about the pilot district project? And most people didn't seem to. And wow. so um, what this exhibit is doing is taking a story that um, at the time people certainly knew what was going on um, with the project. But in the 50 years since, it's one of the untold stories of, of Washington, D.C. And so um, the Building Museum and the Historical Society wanted to work together to get this story out there and um, to sort of join in the conversation that's going on nationally right now about police and community relations. Now, when, the two, when you were looking at these slices of history, these pieces of our past, what did you discover that surprised you? Well, oh. I, I, <laughs> I think um, it's always great to see when the community kind of gets together and tries to uh, be part of their own governance and their own uh, neighborhood watch. And so watching, one of the things they did with the Pilot District Project is have an election and it was called the Citizens Board and the citizens were supposed to help work with the police um, in the neighborhood to kind of change the way that policing worked in the neighborhood. And uh, even though it was called a flop and even though many people thought it was a kind of a disaster and they were worried about the relationships between the police and the African Americans, especially in that neighborhood, the people in the neighborhood really tried to be part of it and really kind of got together and, and really agitated for change. And I always mm -hmm. like to see that. Now we hear a lot, what we in DC know a lot about Marion Barry, of course, <laughs> but it was interesting to find out that he even had uh, a spot 
had a Absolutely. role in what was a, happening. Absolutely, a big then. role. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was his yeah. first elected office in the District of Columbia. So yeah, so I think that's mm -hmm. a that's a it's a neat kind of addendum to his story. Especially, um, we're gonna put up a statue of him in front of the yes. city building, and people are really trying to look at his legacy in the city and kind of explore it more. So this is an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, while we're talking about his story to really see. He came here just a couple years before um, the pilot district project, and he uh, um, he really was upset uh, with with police brutality and with other issues um, of the police relationships with the community and so he ran for the citizens board kind of put his own slate together there was a lot of uh, animosity I think between <laughs> um, he was already I think he was already Marion Barry um, so he when it comes along with everything that that means one of the pieces in, in the in Anne's collection in the historical society's collection was a, a chart showing how late uh, Mr. Barry was to all the meetings uh, over time. <laughs> oh, wow. um, and they were so angry about it that they actually kind of charted his progress. Got later and later and later as the as the project went on. But he was um, he was really influential, of course, way back at the beginning. Are you mm -hmm. both lifelong district residents? Um, no, my husband is, and okay. I'm raising two <laughs> third generation Washingtonians, including a nine week old. Um, but I'm from New York City originally. Okay. Actually, I've been here for about 15 years. And you love it, right? I love it. <laughs> I absolutely. absolutely love it. And um, it's one of the awesome things about my job being at the Historical Society. My job is to learn more about the city that I call now, now call home, um, and to make sure that the stories of all the different communities of Washington, D.C. are documented and preserved and uh, available for people 10, 15, 20 years down the road to see what everyday life was for, for Washingtonians of all stripes. So now, quickly, before work. we run out of time, yeah. tell us uh, what we'll find in the exhibit. What are some yes. of the, the visuals that we'll see? Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's um, it's a lot of really interesting material, including these um, uh, election posters that people created when they were running for the Citizens Board. And you have everything from uh, very prof professionally produced posters to handwritten posters saying, vote for me. You know, mm -hmm. And I think it's, as Sarah mentioned, the idea of, of an election is so... Um, it's so critical, particularly in a place like Washington, D.C. This is happening pre-home rule, right? So the idea that you can run for office and be elected by your neighbors, by your peers, I think is particularly intriguing and important to, to document. So um, those posters, we have some fantastic maps that are coming out that are showing, and of course, it, it's at the National Building Museum. So yes. this is reflecting um, the built environment of Washington and how neighborhoods are created, how actually it's, it's reflecting a... Um, uh, a district, the third district, third police district, um, which encompasses several different neighborhoods. So um, you can see how these different neighborhoods and the representatives from those neighborhoods are coming together to try to make things better. I love this. Yes. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, we'll go together. Okay. All right. I love that. Thank you both. Thank you so <laughs> Thanks much. Thanks so for much. having us. Coming up, immigration attorney Lorda Jorge has two loves, her legal work helping others and her music. And once a dreamer herself, Lloyd A's story continues to live in her music. Don't go away. We'll be right back. It's the 202. 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 Welcome back to the 202. During evening gigs, her soulful jazz performances can be heard in music venues around the city. But nine to five, Lorda George is an attorney whose passion is to give a voice to the city's immigrants. Hi, Lorda. Hi. Lorda, Lorde. Lorde. <laughs> Whatever you You get hear. that all the time, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds musical, however you pronounce there it. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> it is a beautiful name. Thank you. Beautiful name. Thank you. Well, listen, you know, could you just tell us a bit of your story um, as it relates to the Dreamers and what you're doing? Sure. Well, actually, um, my family immigrated uh, in the early 80s. We moved from France to Michigan um, and the time that they came they came as students they soon lost their student visa status because they couldn't afford the tuition and um, in that same period of time uh, they because we were in Michigan we were near farms and to supplement their income because they did not have status to work they worked on the farms and um, during the 80s, Reagan passed laws that allowed individuals that worked in the agricultural sector 
to obtain visas and because of that series of events my parents were able to get green cards and eventually I was able to get a green card um, but there was a good stretch of time where I was undocumented I did not get my green card until I was in high school wow. and I did not become a citizen until I was in college so the term dreamer was not around back then but I absolutely would have been qualified or classified as one had there been that term. Um, anyway, fast forward now to the 2000s. <laughs> yes. And my life passion outside of the music is immigration law. Um, I went to law school here in DC at uh, American University Washington College of Law. Mm -hmm. And it is there that I fell in love with immigration law. Wow. And I've been practicing for the last 12 years as an immigration attorney in the district. Now, does it help that D.C. is a sanctuary city? Does that help you in dealing with your clients? If anything, it gives my client base a reprieve, a psychological reprieve. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing that the past and current mayors have done to maintain a sense of it's not us against them. Mm. Um, if you really think, if you really pull a, apart the historical context of who and what America is. If you're not Native American, and if your descendants were not African slaves, you're an immigrant. Your grandparents were immigrants, your great-grandparents were immigrants. We are a special and unique sovereign country, nation, where we're built on the, the backs of slaves and immigrants. And that legacy needs to be maintained because it is a part of who America is. And I, I think it's a beautiful thing that the District of Columbia has decided to take a stand really and say hey listen we are here to make sure that our city functions and is safe and our police are not going to be working as an extension of federal immigration agents and in that way it's it creates a safe space emotionally for folks but it doesn't necessarily um, change the laws on the ground yes so it's a stressful time right now because the policies on the ground right now are very anti-immigrant Wow. There's no way to even finesse that. It is interesting you mentioned the word stressful. Is the connection to jazz an outlet for you? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Music has always been a part of my life. And um, DC is a wonderful place as a musician um, because there are so many quality musicians here. And so if you're in a space where you're trying to either grow in your craft, perform or share, there's a lot of folks that you can collaborate with as I have been blessed enough to do. And um, there are a lot of wonderful venues to share that music with. And there are a lot of people that actually like to listen to it. Yes, yeah. yes. Now you come at this, this music with uh, your, your, one of your parents being born in West Africa, one in East Africa, yes. you were born in France. Yes. You grew up in California. Uh, how does it all affect your music? You did your sound? homework. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's everything that you hear when I perform. Okay. Um, so my parents, even though they're from two different ends of the continent, yes. they were both colonized by Portugal. So that means we speak Portuguese at home. And so um, there's a, and, and Portuguese speakers are called Lusophone speakers but we're still African, so there's an Afro-Lusophone twinge to what I do. Afro-Lusophone. Ah. Correct, okay. yeah, yeah. And then I grew up in California, yeah. and I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and there was some serious music coming out of that time, whether you're dealing with hip-hop, pop, um, hip pop, R&B, all of that influenced me. And then I come from, from a very religious family, mm -hmm. so church was a big thing, so, uh, all of that adds context. You, you're not necessarily hearing every single you know, note bringing right. all of that together, but there's gonna be different pockets in music where you're like, wait a minute. And so, and I'm thankful for that because it makes what I do special. Yeah, and yeah. jazz seems so perfect because it's some of everything and you can't really hit a wrong note. Absolutely. But you have to be so precise in the law. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And we've seen you uh, playing at Blues Alley, and I understand in your performances, you go in and out of different languages in your performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, English and Portuguese. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I stick to what I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, it's been fantastic talking with you, but you know, there's always music that we're always ready Absolutely. to hear. Hold on. 
Inspired by her roots, her music and voice is a fusion of cultures and genres. Oh, when we come back, the <laughs> multi-rooted jazz singer Lloydie George brings that unique sound to the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. And welcome back to the 202 and an artist who personifies multicultural sound. Well, Lordy George, you know what happens on the soundstage, right? performance, right? We gotta sing, we gotta <laughs> do the music. And you have someone here with you. I do, this is Mungesi Nkata, my guitarist. Uh, we've been performing and writing music together for about eight or nine years now. Wow. Awesome, well Welcome. we're ready to hear you do your thing. Okay, right. we're ready too. Ready, all right, let's go. shoulder and dust his shoulder curses the day that he paid to play now he is bolder he is colder and now the winter fades spring melts the ice brigade as love grows bolder as love grows bolder every day his heart expires his pain retires as he longs for her every day every day his heart expires, his pain retires, as he longs for her every day. Oh, in Pondo, oh, in Pondo, oh, in Pondo, oh, in Pondo. It's quiet now, he takes a bow. The dance is over, the dance is over. He takes his hand away from her. And does his shoulder, and does his shoulder, curses the day that he paid to play. Now he is colder, he is colder, and now the winter fades, spring melts the ice brigades. As a love grows bolder, as a love grows bolder, every day his heart expires, his pain retires, as he longs for her every day, every day. His heart expires, his pain retires, as he longs for her every day. Oh, in Pondo, oh, in Pondo, oh, in Pondo, oh, in Pondo. Quiet now, he takes a bow. The dance is over. The dance is over. He takes his hand away from her and dots his shoulder and dots his shoulder. Curses the day that he paid to play. Now he is colder. He is colder. And now the winter fades, spring melts the ice brigades As love grows bolder, as love grows bolder Every day his heart is tired, his pain retires As he longs for her every day Every day his heart expires, his pain retires As he longs for her every day Oh, in Pondo, oh, in Pondo, oh, 
in Pondo, oh in Pondo, oh in Pondo. It's quiet now. It takes a bow. The dance is over. The dance is over. The dance is over. Time brown turns to green again In time heart will start to heal In time broken turns to whole again In time numb starts to feel Da mi tempo pra restaurar Da mi tempo pra descansar Da mi tempo pra chorar Da mi tempo pra amar Minha saúde, minha alma, meu coração, oh, 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 oh. Enche, oh meu Deus, com amor, dá-me uma solução. E I start to breathe again, leave pain by the door. No choice but to love again. Now it's time to restore. Da mi tempo pra restaurar. Da mi tempo pra descansar. Da mi tempo pra chorar. Da mi tempo pra amar. Minha saúde, minha alma, meu coração. Oh, oh, oh. Enche o oh meu Deus com amor, dá-me uma solução. Tempo para restaurar, tempo para descansar, tempo para chorar, tempo para pensar, tempo para amar, tempo para cantar, amar, amar, amar. In time brown turns to green again In time broken starts to heal In time numb starts to feel again In time I'll become real Da mi tempo pra restaurar Da mi tempo pra descansar Da mi tempo pra chorar Da mi tempo pra cantar Minha saúde, minha alma, meu coração, oh, 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 oh. Enche, oh meu Deus, com amor, dá-me uma solução. Minha saúde, minha alma, meu coração, oh, 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 oh. Enche, oh meu Deus, com amor, dá-me uma solução. Brown will turn green again In time, in time My heart will start to feel again In time, in time My heart will start to beat again You two have 
grace this stage today. Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so much. Thank it's you. beautiful and it's important and we're Thanks. so glad that you joined us. All right, we had a great show today. Thanks to our guests, Lord of George and the Historical Society of Washington, D.C. And my co-host, Michelle Wright. Yes, thank you. And thanks to DJ Casper and to all of you for watching us. Furman and I are going to see you again next time on The 202. And don't forget, check out episodes of The 202 on DC Radio. That's at 96.3 HD4 and dcradio.gov. So don't get no tighter. Yeah. Furman and Michelle can't get, get no right Taxation, no representation. Nah. But the 202 repping for the capital nation. Uh -huh. So from 703 to the 301. Yeah. yeah, we all come to have some fun. It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. This is how we do when we party in the 202. Yeah. It's the 202. Yeah. It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. Yeah. It's the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. This is how we do when we party it's in the, the 202. It's the 202. It's the 202. Uh. It's the 202.